Sertinib is um, actually the first of the second generation class of ALK inhibitors, and it was tested initially in a global phase one trial um, a number of years ago now. I, I believe now it's been over five years. Um, and this uh, more potent ALK inhibitor um, also inhibits uh, the most common crizotinib resistance mutations as well. So not only is it more potent, but it can overcome the known on-target resistance mechanisms to crizotinib. So we tested uh, seritinib first um, in this phase one study. It was a dose escalation followed by dose expansion at the maximum tolerated dose. And this was quite a remarkable trial because in addition to defining the safety and the dosing of seritinib, we also observed very impressive anti-tumor activity of seritinib in ALK positive patients, those who had failed prior crizotinib, so they were crizotinib resistant, and also those who had never been on crizotinib. Um, and subsequent to the phase one trial, um, which actually led to accelerated approval of seritinib for crizotinib resistant patients, we then confirmed the data in phase two, as well as now a phase three trial. So I would say across all of the studies of seritinib, what we do see is that seritinib is highly active in patients who have failed crizotinib. The response rate is between 40 and 50% in all of the seritinib studies. And the, uh, Medium progression free survival is in the range of five to seven months. So, most patients who fail on crizotinib will go on to respond to seritinib. In the phase one study, we also looked specifically at the resistance mechanisms that were driving relapses on crizotinib, and what we saw was that patients with resistance mutations, like the gatekeeper mutation within ALK, but also patients without ALK resistance mutations, did all seem to respond to seritinib, a more potent ALK inhibitor. So we believe that seritinib and other more potent second generation and third generation ALK inhibitors really are a new standard of care for patients when they fail crizotinib. So some of the patients may become uh, intolerant to chrysotinib due to toxicity, either liver toxicity or permanent toxicity. So the common thing to do is to switch to another TKI, tyrosine kinase inhibitor, namely either seritinib or anatinib. In general, there's no cross-sensitivity between the first and second generation of drug. So patients who develop a toxicity to chrysotinib may not necessarily develop, develop the toxicity to seritinib or anatinib. So therefore, these two drugs potentially can be considered. So seritinib has been a fantastic therapy. Uh, we know in patients who are chrysotinib naive and in patients who've received prior chrysotinib that seritinib is very active. Seritinib is, of course, approved to be used in that setting beyond the first-line setting following crizotinib. It's been proven to be uh, a more effective strategy than moving on to chemotherapy. Uh, and by itself, it's quite active, high response rates, high uh, effect in terms of control of CNS metastases. Um, it's a safe medication as well. It, it has uh, some issues that um, are more GI-related, so patients uh, can have more uh, nausea, vomiting, and even diarrhea with this medication, sometimes even just a general malaise or fatigue that comes with uh, seritinib. But what, what is common for practitioners who use seritinib uh, are dose reductions. And so starting at the full dose of seritinib, 750 milligrams, is, um, is achievable for some patients, but for a lot of patients, we just simply make dose reductions down to 600 milligrams, for example, we also do things like give it at nighttime or have patients take it with an anti-emetic or with food. Uh, and there's data at this meeting in Vienna to show that uh, that's a, a, a more useful strategy to, uh, for tolerability. So there are ways to adjust around some of these toxicities and allow patients to uh, achieve all the benefits of seritinib. Many of us have stories of patients who've been on drugs like seritinib following long periods of good control on crizotinib, patients who've been on seritinib for years doing quite well. Yeah, so we, uh, at, at our center in, uh, in Nashville, we had the privilege of being involved in some of the earliest seritinib studies uh, when uh, we were trying to understand the role of seritinib. And so patients got access to this active drug uh, uh, far before it was approved. And, and I am happy to report that we still have patients uh, on those agents doing quite well. In fact, I just saw uh, one of these patients uh, from another state just uh, a couple of weeks ago. We've had to make some adjustments in her care. That's a good example of uh, the kind of things that you do in real life. So we've had to lower 
her uh, dose of medication. Actually, believe it or not, now going on, on to four years here, we've had to lower her medication a second time, even after doing so well on the first dose reduction for an extended period. Um, but she's doing well and continues, fortunately, to have good disease control. It's worth mentioning her, because you've because we were discussing one of my patients, uh, that uh, we've had to deal with issues like brain metastases during her care. So a good example of a patient who actually had a brain lesion at diagnosis, was asymptomatic. We were allowed to put her on the trial with seritinib. We got good control of that lesion for years until we found growth in that in a new lesion. And we've treated those with stereotactic radiosurgery controlled that, and she's maintained control systemically of disease with seritinib, even at the dose reductions. So it's, it's uh, keeping somebody on a therapy, but incorporating radiation at periods in her therapy to deal with issues like brain metastases. Um, a little bit different than how we normally treat lung cancer with just chemotherapy and moving on to another drug when someone progresses.